Now, before I start, I, j- I just really have to say this because this is a subject that uh, people can get offended really easy. We all come from different backgrounds, different uh, church backgrounds, spiritual backgrounds. We've experienced different situations in our life, uh, depending on where we grew up. And so I want to be sensitive to that and understand that, but I also want to be true to the Word. We have to be true to the Word. And I think that, that you also want that, to be true to the Word. In fact, most people who have fallen from the simplicity of the, bo- the Bible, the Gospel, and it's truth, usually are blinded in some way because of some person who has come in and has directed them through, through their interpretation of scriptures. And so then they take hold of that interpretation, they make it their own, they start applying it, and after 20 years it's hard to get rid of something like that when you've lived it all of your life. And so I understand that. There's still things in my own life that I'm trying to get rid of from my Catholicism and just the way that I grew up and so forth. So I understand that, but we need to understand, and I want to make it very clear, that we want to listen to what God says in His Word and agree with that. More than agree with me or agree with any other man. It's important that we believe the Word of God over everything else, and so we need to be in the Word of God. So saying that, how many of you know someone that can manipulate the truth or a lie and make it sound like the truth they can take a lie and bring it to you and they can make it sound like it's the truth you know anyone like that for those of you that are into electronics i had a friend that um was great at doing this and he did it on purpose i mean you just knew it when he did it and he he enjoyed doing it it's not, he would reveal it afterwards, but he just enjoyed uh, being able to, to take a lie and make it sound like a truth and watch how people react to it. He, he talked about a diode. I don't know if you know what a diode is. A, a diode is, is, is a little device that allows current to flow into one direction. Okay? It can't flow the other direction. It's impossible. It, it's used to, to bring current in that direction for a specific reason and you hooks it up to the other circuit parts of the board and so forth. So that's all its function is. Just allow it to go in. It doesn't come back. And so he was in a room we called the demand room. We were fixing electronic demand uh, registers for the meters that are out there in the industry. And he was in a demand room and he just starts these conversations. Just a really well-spoken individual, very smart. Uh, individual reads a lot and so forth and he started talking about this new diode this new diode that came out that not only allows uh, current to flow in one direction but now it allows current to flow in the other direction and the guys are going no that, that, that's not the purpose of it no no and he started you know going at, going and just expounding and, and directing and, and talking about the material and all that next thing you know the guys are like wow that's amazing that they actually have that and he's just laughing He's busting him at the end. He's like, I'm lying. I'm lying. You know, and everybody's like, Argh. it's hard to believe a guy like that, huh? And the next time he starts talking to you, and, and he had a reputation of that. You know, every time he spoke, people are like, okay, I don't know if I want to believe him or not. You know, they can mold their words in such a great way that many will believe them. This is one of those serious subjects uh, that we need to really pay attention to, and I understand that. I don't want to joke too much about it because it's important that we understand that there are people out there that can take a lie and make it sound like the truth, and we need to be aware of that. You know, I am 53 years old, and I've been around for a long time. And I've seen it all, not just in the industry and how men respond and how they lie and how they cheat and how they steal and how they manipulate. I've seen it all. I've seen it within the church. You know, I've seen it applied. I've seen men turn things around in other directions, you know, and it's very hard, hard to respond to those things when you are deceived by these men. And Peter will be dealing with those who are experts at lying here. Let me say something about lying real quick, just so you understand what God's view on lying is. God hates lying. He doesn't like liars, you know, and yet we at times fall into lies, whether it's on our taxes or other situations, but we should really try our hardest not to be liars, to be sincere, to make our yeses yes, like the Bible says, right? If you say yes, then you mean yes. You don't mean maybe. I love it how some guys will say, well, Lord willing, and that's a good thing. 
you know, Lord willing, I'll be able to be there. What they're saying is I probably won't be there, is what they're really saying. But to have a man that says yes, and he means yes. Or if he says no, then no, and that's fine. And so a person that lies manipulates, and God hates that. Proverbs 6, 16 says, These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, and that is lying tongue is one of them. A lying tongue. It says he hates those things. Proverbs twelve twenty two: Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. An abomination, that's a big word. That means God really hates it. He uses that word for the Antichrist who will sit in the temple of God and make himself out to be God. That that will be an abomination to God, to take the place of God. So lying is an abomination in the eyes of God. Revelation 21.8 says, But the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and, and it's interesting, John here uses, uses the word all. He says, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burn with fire and brimstone. All liars. Not just some liars, but all liars. Now, now, why is it that liars have their part in the lake of fire? That a liar who practices lying and it's a part of their deceptive lives, why is it that they have a part in the lake of fire? I mean, is lying a big deal? A lot of us don't view lying as being too bad. I remember I had a boss one time, and uh, we were discussing... Uh, some situation at work, and I says, you, you, you're lying to me. And he said to me, Reuben, don't you understand that in the corporate world, they expect you to lie? That's just the way it is. And if you can get away with it, you get away with it. And I'm like, that's not right. That's just not right. He goes, hey, that's the way it is. And so lying comes easy to people. If you can lie to them and, and get away with it, hey, good for you. You know, you've done your job. Well, God says all liars will inherit the pit, the pit, the pit. Now, why? Because you're speaking to people as a Christian or as a person, and you're supposed to speak truth, and yet you're speaking lies. You're deceiving them, and thus you're bringing this, this characteristic out that's supposed to be godly, and yet it's ungodly, and it's not representing God whatsoever, and so it's considered to be a sin that's Worthy of eternal damnation. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good. And so lying is wrong. And I, I wanted to make that point up front because the people that Peter is talking about are people that are liars. Okay? And, and we know if they're liars and they're manipulators and there's corrupt communication, then we know that in the end when they stand before God, guess what? God say, I never knew you. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. And so we saw in chapter 1, verse 20 through 21, let me read it again. Know this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now Peter is setting up chapter 2 by these two verses. He's saying the word of God is very important. It's not of private interpretation. Not one man can interpret the scriptures for you and then you follow that man's interpretation. That interpretation should be well established, not just with one man, but with many men, with many churches that have a basic understanding of scripture interpretation. And so when the Bible says you should read your word, then every pastor in a church should be saying you should read your word. Because this is what the Bible says and you can say that safely. But if a man says, look, the Bible says that I am to teach you the word, and so don't worry about reading your word. I will teach it to you, and then you will listen to me and then believe what I'm saying. That's when you run into problems. Because now he has a private interpretation. He has a motive behind his teaching, and that is to deceive you. Hopefully, if you don't read your word, then you won't know the truth, and then I can manipulate you and lead you around blindly to take whatever I want from you. And that's really the whole purpose of these men. So Peter establishes the fact that, that prophecy is not of one person. That teaching is not given to one individual. That it all came through God, through the Holy Spirit as he moved them. Now the context here, and we need to understand this, it's been over 30 years since the ascension of Christ. Christ has ascended unto heaven. And then within those 30 years, false teachers have crept into the church and are gaining momentum. They're growing. 
There's always an opportunity for men to creep into the church and take advantage of the church. That's sad. That's a sad place to be. And Peter wants to go on record with the believers before he passes away that you need to be warned not to believe these men. Be warned before I leave. Be concerned because these men will creep into your churches and they will have wonderful words. They will speak greatly. They're very charismatic. They're very loving on the outward. They're very caring. They're, you know, they're, they'll even be helpful. But the whole thing is all to manipulate you to take something from you. Manipulation shouldn't be within the Christian church. We shouldn't be manipulating one another. Encouraging one another. Be very clear. Get involved. Help us. We need help. But not manipulate you to help. Not manipulate you to give. But to trust in the Lord that he will put that on your heart as you're reading the scriptures. I have this wonderful picture on Facebook for uh, today's message. And it's actually, I can't say this word very well. My granddaughter will have to help me with it later on in her tutoring with me on words. I think it's wolf. Did I get that right? A wolf, and it's got a sheep's clothing on top of it. So it's got the sheep's head, and the wolf is sticking out underneath it. And so that's basically what these men are. They're wolves with sheep's clothing over them. And so we need to understand that. We need to understand that. So verse 1, Peter says, but. Now again, he uses the word but. Now there's that word but. I, I, I don't like that word but used in our daily language. We use it in a negative sense, right? Whenever, whenever we get caught, but I have this excuse, you know, um, or this didn't happen, right? But, but, and there's always a but. Peter uses the but to tie it into the last verses there that there's a contrast coming up, okay? So, so. Here's the scriptures, not a private interpretation, came from God, but there are men that manipulate it, is what he's saying here. There are those, there were also false prophets among the people, even as there were or will be false teachers among you. So, but there were also false prophets among you, or among the people, among the church, even as there will be false teachers among you. Literally, in the midst of you. They will literally join the church. And so Peter warns us about these false prophets and false teachers who are among the people within the church. Are there false prophets in the church? Of course there are. Are there people within the church with ulterior motives? Of course there are. You will always have goats with sheep within the church. You'll always have the wheat and you'll always have tares within the church. Now, I challenge you. I don't know who, who, who it is, you know, and I don't believe it to be anyone here this morning. <laughs> We're a small church, and I know every one of you, but if you know your own heart, and if you are, you need to repent and, and just give your heart back to God and say, Lord, I want to be used by you truthfully and in the Spirit of God and not manipulating my way through situations and so forth. These false prophets are men who falsely claim to be prophets of God or who prophesy falsely. Now, prophesy. They're prophets of God. You may have heard men say, I'm the prophet so-and-so. Be careful when they give themselves titles. Nowhere in the scriptures does it tell us to give ourselves titles. I'm a minister. You know, I don't mind if you call me Reuben. You know, what's the word pastor? Oh, but that's a term of respect. You know what? I don't mind at all if you just say Reuben. If you want to call me Pastor Reuben, that's fine too. Titles don't mean anything at all. We shouldn't put any weight upon the titles and men will stand up and say i am the prophet so and so like it gives them some sort of power and weight because they're a prophet they went to a special school to become prophets and so forth i had a cousin who had lived out in india and she had gone to prophet school and they taught her how to be a prophet prophets prophesy and so they're prophesying they're telling you things of the future they're telling you things that god's going to do they're telling you things that will happen later on in hopes that you will go ah ooh, let's get involved and be manipulated by them. And so they utter falsehoods under the name of divine prophecies. Jehovah Witnesses are false prophets. Now, if you are related to Jehovah Witnesses, you know that they are very inclusive. They don't like to go out. They don't celebrate birthdays. They don't like government. They don't like a lot of things. But there are things that they have prophesied that would take place in the future that never came true. In 1877, the end of the world, that is the end of the gospel and the beginning of the millennium age is near 
than more, most men suppose. Indeed, we have already entered a transition period, which is to be a time of trouble, such as never since there been in this nation. And this is written in N.H. Barbour and C.T. Russell, Third World of the Harvest of This World, page 17 of their books. The world was coming to an end in 1877. Well, it did not because we're still here. In 1876, Russell, Russell, Russellfer was the founder of Jehovah Witness, became interested in time prophecy. After reading a copy of Barber's publication, Herald of the Morning, the end had not come in 1874, as the Adventists had predicted. However, Barber explained, explained that Matthew 24, 27 meant Jesus' invisible present commenced in 1874. I love that. I, I, you remember back in 1988? 1987 might have been the first one where the guy said, 87 reasons why Christ is returning this year. And he wrote a little pamphlet. I bought that pamphlet, it was like a dollar. So I contributed to, to his false teaching and prophecies. And, and I read through the whole prophet and it goes through all these formulas and the 6,000 we've been here. And of course, all of a sudden everybody was waiting and 18, or 1988 came. And so he wrote another one saying, uh, 88 reasons why the Lord's returning this year. And of course, people bought again. Now, <clears throat> he used the excuse of Christ did come back, but he came back spiritually and not physically. And they always fall down on that, okay? But he didn't come back, yeah, because you know what? He really came back spiritually. In a sense, he came back in the spirit sense here for the second time, and he's doing a work, but he is coming again. And so they always have a fallback on these prophecies that they have. Of course, we're still here, right? Spurgeon said of these men, these destroyers of our churches appear to be as content with their work as monkeys with their mischief. It's, it's interesting how these people really believe this stuff. They're so deceived that they really believe it and they live it. And their followers are like, you know, yes, we've, we believe you too, you know, like a robot just following them into the headlights like a deer, you know, type of thing. False teachers take the scriptures and they water down the, and manipulate the word to fit their own selfish needs. So false prophets and then there's false teachers who take the word of God and they manipulate the word of God to meet their own needs. They, husbands are good at this sometimes. Whenever they want their wives to do something, we, we kind of go, doesn't the Bible say submit yourselves to your husbands? You know, and we use that scripture to try to get our way. Well, yes, it does say that, but you're using it for the wrong reasons, you know. You are supposed to create within your wife a desire to come and be your helpmate, not that they would submit because of your great awesome authority, you know type of thing and we, we do that and yet there are men there are men who get out there and they take the scriptures and they manipulate them to get something from you christian science christian science it was begun by uh, mary eddie baker 1821 1910 she was a pioneer in new ideas about spirituality and health inspired by her own experience of healing in 1866 eddie spent years in bible study prayer research of various healing methods the result was a system of healing she dubbed Christian Science in 1879. Her book, Science and Health with Key, Keys to the Scriptures, broke new ground in the understanding of the mind, body, and spirit connection. She went on to found a college, a church, a publishing enterprise, and the research or respected newspaper, the Christian Science uh, Monitor. Because of its similarity to other groups, many believe Christian science is to be a non-Christian cult. Christian science teaches that God, Father, Mother of all, is completely good and wholly spiritual, and that all God's creation, including the true nature of every person, is the flawless spiritual likeness of the divine. In other words, we're all divine, and God is a mother. Since God's creation is good, evil such as disease, death, and sin cannot be a part of the fundamental reality. Rather, these evils are the result of living apart from God. Prayer is a central way to come closer to God and heal human illnesses. This difference from the Bible, which teaches that man is born in sin, 
inherited from Adam's fall, and that sin separates us from God. Without God's saving grace through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, we would never be healed of that ultimate infirmity of sin and sickness. Different teaching, because she had a, a, a topic, a thought, and she then began to prove it through the scriptures. Turn to Jude in your Bible. And it's to the right there of Peter, a couple of books over. And look at verse 3. Beloved, Jude says, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our Lord God into lasciviousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. These men creep in, and they take the grace of God and they turn it into sin. They tell other men, it's okay for you to sin, that God's grace will abound and, and you can live that way. One, one of the greatest things that I see today is Christians living together. They are actually, actually contemplating, saying nowhere in Scripture does it say that we need to get married, that we need some government to tell us that we're married, and so we live together and we believe that we're married. It's interesting because you, you read Jesus' words and he talks as though they're married. And then says, you know, you asked for a certificate of a divorce, and, and so Moses gave it to you. And so he speaks as though they're married, and so he's not disagreeing with it. He actually is saying, you're married. There's a system by which you get married, and there's a system by which you can get divorced. And so there is marriage, and it was established there by God himself, and we need to follow the laws of the land. And yet they'll say that living in fornication before God. And they'll take God's grace and they'll turn it into lasciviousness, as it says here. But I want to remind you, he says in verse 5, though you once knew this, that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh. These men who creep in are dreamers. They have great visions. You know, they have great thoughts. They have great grandeur things that they want to see accomplished and so forth and so they defile the flesh reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries yet michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of moses dared not bring uh, against him a reviling accusation but said the lord rebuke you but these speak evil whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally like brute beast in these things they corrupt themselves woe to them for they have gone in the way of Cain they have run greedily in the way of uh, Balaam for profit and perish in the rebellion of Korah amazing stuff and you can read that uh, later on uh, what Jude talks about these men creeping into the church Jesus said watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are are fervorous wolves By their fruits you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushels and figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Jesus himself said, watch out for false prophets who come. A warning. And Peter goes on and he says in the next statement, who will secretly bring in deceptive heresies. Now heresies are teachings, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves Swiss destruction. They'll sneakily go around, coverly enter in so that an unwary, simple people will not even notice what these teachers are bringing in because they're not in the word of God and they believe it. They're destructive heresies, he calls them. Someone wrote this, when it comes to the church today, there are some who feed their flock 
what amounts to spiritual ice cream and candy. Feel-good sermons whose aim is to make people feel happy, to help them feel good about themselves. Sermons where people are never convicted, never confronted, or never even challenged. Although the congregation is happy, not healthy, and we're looking to build healthy people in this church. That's why we're having a, a ministry meeting to, to kind of springboard to the people that are in ministry and those that desire to be in ministry. Is we don't care about numbers here. We care about health here. We care that you're healthy, that we're healthy as teachers and leaders, and that the body will be healthy in what we do. That we're serving with the right heart, the right motives, that we're concerned in loving one another healthily. If we're not healthy, then the whole body is affected by it. So we want a healthy church. But there are some that don't want a healthy church. They want a big church. And so they feed them cookies and cream, you know, in a sense, you know, so that they get happy. And they're very happy. See, church isn't about being happy when you go in there. It's about hearing the truth. It's not even about the man that's up there preaching. Some people go to church because I want to hear that man because the way he uses words and because he's, the way that he's able to, to use them and bring across the word of God is just wonderful. But we're not there for that man. We're there to hear the word of God. First, you're to go to church because God's calling you to church and then calling you to a place to be a part of the body of Christ and to be active in that body of Christ. That's, that's fundamental from the very beginning. You see it in the early church but not to a place where a man is because everybody else is going there to that individual so that you can be happy. He goes on and says, and there are other spiritual leaders or movements who feed their congregations or followers what amounts to poison, causing their congregation to never come to life but remaining dead in their sins and sermons. Paul gives us a warning to the elders of the church of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, 27 through 32, he says, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. That's an admonition to me. Paul says, look, I've given you the whole counsel, so my job is to give you the whole counsel from Genesis to Revelation. I got two more books, and I have taught through the whole Bible. And it's all on tapes and all on DVDs. And so I have given the whole counsel of God, a very well-balanced counsel and not a very intellectual counsel that's way out there because I'm not even out there. I'm not even there, but just the very simple counsel of the word. Shepherding the flock of God because it's God's flock and not my flock. Protecting them from those that would come in as wolves to destroy. I've had to do that periodically as people have come in. There was a couple years ago who came in and they were part of the faith movement. And the reason they were here is because they left the faith church that they were at because they were not able to give as much as others within that church and they felt inferior. When they came here, they outgave the whole church. That's how much they were giving because they really believed in this faith uh, Plant, seed planting thing and if they planted seed of faith uh, of money then god would bless them with more money they really believe that and so they came here out giving the whole church it was amazing just to see that and so we started flourishing as far as being able to do things but they left that church because they didn't give enough and i thought that's crazy how much did they give over there now, that's the kind of garbage that goes around you know, and confuses people. But I had to finally confront them because they were going around telling people, you need to tithe so God will bless you. They were going around telling people, we need to take this church and, and talk more about tithing so that we can build a university on the corner here. You know, they, they had these great ideas, you know, and they were trying to get it done through this faith type of mentality. And I finally had to sit them down and say, it's not what scripture says. And, and as I sat them down, they ended up leaving the church, of course. These people deny the Lord, Peter says. They deny the Lord. Now, Peter understands that. He denied the Lord. He understands the bitterness behind it all. He understands the, the, the fact of fear and so forth. But these people literally, literally deny the Lord. And purposely, they have no relationship with the Lord. And Jesus said, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. They deny the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is Lord. You talk to a false prophet or a false teacher, they don't really know the Lord. 
not at all. I had a friend of mine that came from one of these faith churches uh, out in West Covina. I won't tell you which one it is. But he was telling me about a pastor out there that uh, was writing a book on tithing. It seems like they all wrote books on tithing. And at the same time, he said, this is what was interesting, is that he was sleeping with a lot of the girls in, within the church. You know? He goes, and I didn't understand that, but he's the pastor, you know, so I have to accept that you know, and serve and so forth. And it was like, wow, that is crazy. They deny the Lord. They don't know the Lord whatsoever. They teach heresies uh, as a part of that denial, those false teachings. They'll even deny the virgin birth, the deity of Jesus Christ, you know, that he is God in the flesh, the bodily resurrection, maybe Jesus resurrected in the spirit, or even the second coming that we're living during the millennium age. They bring on themselves, as Peter said, swift destruction, swift destruction. Next verse. And many will follow their deceptive ways. The hardest people to reach are those who have been deceived by these people. You know, have been indoctrinated and brainwashed in a sense. It's so sad to see one of those people brainwashed like that. Years ago, there was a, uh, I'd probably say about 20 years ago, when we were here at Calvary Chapel, Mariloma, um, a pastor came and visited and he did this whole study. Back then, we didn't have the technology, so he did it all on cassette tapes. He took all of these faith teachers, Paul Crouch, Freddie Price, you know, uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart, Jimmy Stewart, <laughs> Uh, what's his name? Swaggered, Swaggered yeah. Uh, and all these you know, guys, he took their, their teachings, he broke them up into sections where they were saying certain things. And then he, he taught it from the Pope, and he was going from Calvary's to Calvary's, you know, sharing with him about these false teachers you know, that were into the prosperity doctrine or the healing doctrine and so forth. And then he would play the, the, the parts on there. Uh, Paul Crouch, I remember, I remember seeing this one where he was, he was really upset that, that churches were coming against the, some of the teachings that were played on TV because they were false. And he got so upset, he said, I'd take my holy spirit machine gun and kill you all <laughs> you know type of thing on tv you know i'm like wow that's crazy you bunch of and he called them heretics you know and he says i am a little god you know type of thing and it's like wow wow you know and yet people don't understand this when that when he taught that up there it was amazing even in our church people came up and says you shouldn't be teaching that stuff some of these guys are nice guys i listened to them for years they're okay you know, they've helped me. I've had healings through them and so forth. No, you've had healings through God, not through them. And maybe they're demonic healings, who knows, just so you believe their deceptive ways. It says, but they're wrong. But the poor pastor, he was shaking afterwards because people were coming up confronting him, you know, and so we prayed for him and said, keep doing it, be strong, be faithful, because it's a message that needs to go out. You know, but people are indoctrinated. They're deceived by this stuff because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Like one other translation said it this way, because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemy. Because of these people, it's hard to reach people now. Oh, you're a Christian? Yeah, okay, I know about you. I see you guys on TV, TBN, you know? You're rolling all over the place. You're dancing, you know? You're making jokes and, and so forth. You know, I was watching Jesse, uh, I call him DuPont, DuPont, you know? And he's like a, a, a white guy imitating a, a, an African-American guy. And he was just like, you know, you get a black preacher, you know, and he gets up there and he's like, yeah, Lord, you know, and he's, everyone's laughing. Then you get a white teacher and he's like, okay, let us turn to the book of blah, 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 blah. You know, and he's just joking the whole time. That's his whole ministry, making people laugh. And then he's like, now you need to sow a seed of faith in this ministry, you know, if you touch your heart, you know, type of thing. It's crazy. And people see that and they're like, well, you want me to join Christianity? And they have this mindset in their head. No, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, why should I? You know, they blaspheme the Lord because of it. And it's sad. Now, I know and you know that when God gets a hold of a heart, that it's God who gets a hold of that heart. We just need to pray for those people that are deceived. Now, here's the real reason that they're, they're even exploiting um, with these false prophets and, and teachers. In verse 3, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. That's the real reason there. Living Translation, which is a paraphrase, puts it this way. They will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. That's the whole purpose. That's the whole reason that they're on there. 
with their fancy suits and all that stuff. Like I said earlier, you know, hey, if you give, then you might win a car, you know, and so everyone's going to give to win a car. That's the wrong purpose for giving, you know. And so they lie, they deceive, they false prophes- give false prophecies, you know, they manipulate the scriptures. Why? To get into your pockets and to give. The literal Young, uh, Young's translation says, molded words of you they shall make merchandise. I love that. Molded words. I mean, they're that cunning that they're able to mold words. It's almost like a gift that's given from Satan, that they're able to mold the words that you're just like, ah, falling into it, like those those mermaid singers in the oceans and the sailors, and they sing, and they're like drawn to it, and they can't just resist it, you know, type of thing. They're just that good. <clears throat> My mother um, recently just got some calls on the phone, and it was apparently a call from a group supporting the National Day of Prayer, saying they're trying to get rid of the National Day of Prayer, and we need your help. Would you give us a check? We'll take it over the phone right now, or a credit card. Or some other ways, and she finally said, no, 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 because I've always told her, Mom, don't give on the phone. Don't believe these lines. You remember several months ago, my mom got in the mail from the publisher's clearinghouse that she was a millionaire, you know, and the guy was already talking to her about going to the account, depositing a check and so forth. Remember that? Now they're, now they're using Christian groups saying, hey, we're trying to fight against those that are wanting to shut down the National Day of Prayer, so give us some money and we'll fight against that. How do you know that that's the group from the National Day of Prayer? How do you really know that? You don't. See, I don't give that way. I'm too shrewd. And I'd rather give to my church knowing where it goes. I will always tell them on the phone, I don't give to you because I don't know who you are. Yeah, you're telling me you're this person, but I don't know you. I don't see any credentials. I don't see anything that proves that you are who you are. And so I'll tell you what. If the Lord lays it on my heart to give to the National Day of Prayer... I will go to their website and I will give to the National Day of Prayer because I know that that's their website. Or I'll go through the church and they can give it to the National Day of Prayer. And that's fine. We do that all the time. People that want to give to Israel, they give to us and then we send it to Israel to various groups. And that's fine. You know what you're getting into. You know that it's going to go in there. You know that it's, it's secure and, and that it's a good cause. You don't know when someone's on the phone though. And so my mom does the right thing. No, no, no. Oh, come on, just, just your visa card? Let's give it here. And then they put, you know, $1,000 on there. And that's it. There was a, here's an illustration. A New York City couple received through the mail two tickets uh, to a smash Broadway hit. Oddly, the gift uh, arrived without a note on there. And they wondered who sent it. But they still attended the show and enjoyed it immensely. Returning to the apartment, they discovered that the bedroom had been ransacked. Valuable furs, jewels, missing... Uh, and on the pillow was a simple note, now you know. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> Crazy. They can mold things, you know, that make us so enticed to it, and then they just rip us off so quickly and easy. Listen to what Paul said in Second Timothy 3.1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brute, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, Paul says, turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives the gullible women loaded down with sin, led away by their various lusts, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. How dare those men do that to other people? How dare us take advantage of the poor? How dare us do that to those that don't have what we have? And we do that. Shame on you when you do that. Shame on them when they do that to the poor. These are God's children. And for us to do something like that, God will hold you accountable to it. I believe that completely. Paul says, turn away from them. Their place is in the pit of hell. For a long time, Peter said, their judgment has been 
has not been idle for dis- for their destruction does not slumber. So Peter concludes, God's judgment is coming. Now when he says it does not slumber, it sure seems like it's slumbering. You know, Lord, how much longer before you come? How much longer before you judge this world? How do we tell if there's a false prophet or teacher among us? A Chinese boy who wanted to learn about jade, the stone jade, went to study under a talented teacher. The teacher gave him a jade stone and said, hold this tightly. And so the boy held it tightly. And the teacher went on to tell him about philosophy, about life. And day after day, he would tell him that over and over and over again. Finally, the boy said, why am I learning about philosophy and life and all these other things and I'm not learning about jades, you know? And he held that thing in his hand every day. Then finally, one day, he said, I'm going to tell the teacher. I'm just going to tell him what is going on here. Why aren't you telling me about jades? And the teacher uh, hands him the jade stone. The boy grabs it and says, that's not a jade stone. And that's the truth. He learned because he held on to it. That's how you know. You know the truth. You know the real thing. And then you will know the false. And so when we're in the Word of God and we're studying the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation then we will know those who are taking advantage of us. Let me close. Let's understand that what, whenever the true work of God is founded, it is not long before satanic counterfeits begin to infiltrate. And so we need to be in the word of God that we may withstand those who are teaching false doctrines or prophecies.